Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fired Up, the podcast for marketers working in early and late stage startups. I'm Morgan McClintic, the CEO of startup marketing agency Firebrand. We've launched this podcast to interview the best in the business, but I'm not going to do it alone. So please meet my co hosts. I'm Nicole Pytel, Firebrand's VP of Content Marketing. And I'm Chris Ulbricht, Firebrand's Head of Media Relations. I'm Ian Lipner, a tech PR and crisis communications veteran. We'll drop a new episode each week, and so there's plenty of fuel for your marketing fire. Get the spark you need to take your startup to a whole new level. Hello, and welcome to Fired Up, the startup marketing podcast where we explore the trends and provide tips about building brand and driving demand for your startup. My name is Morgan McClintic, and I'm joined today by Nicole Patel. Nicole, hi, how are you? Hi, Morgan. Hi, everybody out there. I am super excited about today's guest. I I will tell you, I still remember back in the eighth grade, my science teacher said, you have one chance to make a good first impression, and it has stuck with me all of those years. And our guest today helps brands do exactly that with branding and visual identity. And we are going to have such an amazing creative discussion. Y'all are going to love it. Yes, today we're going to talk about branding, and we're joined by Kate Harris, and she's the co-founder and creative director of Siren, which is a creative agency where she oversees all the creative coming through the agency's doors. Kate has concepted and developed numerous high-profile campaigns for a variety of clients, including PayPal, AWS, TechCrunch, Wired Magazine, The Red Cross, and the city of San Francisco. Her true passion is in bringing new tech and emerging startups to life for their customers. She believes that defining and articulating the soul of the brand is what separates great companies from everyone else. And that's what we want to do. So Kate, welcome to Fired Up. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, it's great to have you here. So I like to start with something topical as we normally do. And this is a story with from The Verge. And I'm just going to read a little bit about it. It's about OpenAI releasing the third version of Dali. They just announced this last week. It's their generative visual AI uh, platform, for those that don't know. And it now lets users use ChatGPT to create prompts and has more safety. And this new feature in Dali is an integration with ChatGPT. By using that, uh, you don't have to come up with your own detailed prompts. They can ask ChatGPT to come up with a prompt. And so that will then design the graphics a lot more easily. So basically, all that prompt engineering is becoming easier to create graphics for people like me who have no kind of artistic skill. So what do you think about that? I think AI is such an exciting development and tool for designers to use. And in the hands of a gifted design studio, it just helps amplify the impact. And especially what we're seeing with startups who might not have the budget to create a custom photo shoot or then stock photography isn't quite encapsulating what they need. It's a fantastic tool to sort of get the message across with visuals that feel really customized and personal. That said, as you said, you know, it's all about how it's garbage in, garbage out, you know. So if your prompts are really good, you can get much better output. And I think oftentimes it sort of takes that art direction and creative eye, at least at this point, to really get great stuff out of there. You know, when we first started using it, every image that we created looked like it belonged in a Buick commercial. And so it was just (laughs) not ideal. But I think all of these programs are improving weekly so rapidly. And they're all right now, you know, when we talked about Mid Journey and Adobe Firefly, they're all sort of borrowing from each other to race to the top. And so, you know, for example, Mid Journey had real trouble with hands on people and and they just fixed that and pushed pushed out some new tech there. So that's gotten a lot better. And, and Adobe Firefly is great with in-painting tech, but, you know, Mid Journey, no doubt next week, will come out with that same feature. I think right now they're they're great generative tools, but they require that design eye to really sing. You know, as a non-graphics designer, we just launched this podcast and coming up with the logo for the podcast. I used one of these tools to create 40 different logos, typing in, hey, do you like this? Change this. 
And at least uh, it created a lot of options to help me know, hey, I like this, I don't like this, and sort of give a better direction to the graphics design team to be able to actually come up with the with the final logo. So even for people who, if you're just briefing a design agency, at least it helps you get to some of the options and give and give you some some actual briefs and outputs. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really great because. It's in the name. It's generative. So it's great for iteration. It's great for throwing things against the wall and seeing what's working. What it lacks is like that conceptual strategic foundation. So it might just sort of attack the surface. You know, if you had a brand for a noodle house, it likely will show you a lot of things around noodles. But let's say it's from your grandmother's recipe and there's all these this deeper contextual meaning behind it. It doesn't get into that deeper meaning, but it does, uh, you know, I just read the editor's note in Wired Magazine, and he was talking about ChatGPT and how he used it to write his intro. And it didn't sound like him or his voice, but it was great at him for seeing where he could edit himself. It's a great partner in helping you expand your thought process and seeing where you can edit yourself, but not for like the conceptual foundation of things. Yeah, we've seen that on the content marketing side as well. You know, it's it's all about the prompt in and what you're trying to get out of it. And I, I agree, great brainstorming tool, but doesn't have that oomph to really get it over the finish line and make it really memorable. Yeah. And Morgan, something you said too, that was interesting is when you created that logo or some of the ones you liked, you were then able to kind of hand it off to a designer that brought it to life in a better way. So I do think there's still that that need for a studio or a designer to amplify it. And especially when you have, you know, as we're going to talk about branding, when you're just creating a logo, it's not the brand, it's just the logo. So, you know, how does how does that brand come to life for its users? There's a great lead into the topic that we really want to cover today, which is branding. So I want to start with a pretty basic question. Like when we talk about brand and about branding, what does that really mean? How does your company walk and talk? How does it come to life for its users? It's really more than just a logo and a couple of words. It's how it comes to life in the world. There was something on LinkedIn the other day that was really interesting about if Nike created a hotel, you know exactly what that hotel looks like just from understanding the brand and the world around it. Now, if Nike was just a logo, that would fall flat and you wouldn't know. Or if Hyatt says they're opening a new hotel, you don't really know what that's, that looks like because it's just really like a cost play, right? You're, it's not a really about the brand. But when you have a fully baked brand world around something uh, where the touch points really connect to all uh, of each other, then you have a, an understanding of how it should come to life in all of those areas. Yeah, and that's a really good point, bringing up those giant companies, because, you know, in the startup world, I think there's this tendency to think, oh, well, we're not that big. We don't need a big, fancy brand. We can worry about that later. And, you know, they stick with a logo and, and a branding guide for, you know, what font they want to use and, and call it a day. What else should go into a brand, regardless if you're a, a seed startup or or a giant enterprise? Right. And that's a great question. I think a lot of times it's true, like seed startups, they, they just have to get an MVP out. They just have to prove that they're real. And that's fine. But I think uh, very quickly, uh, you reach a ceiling there. And sort of the utility of that, it hamstrings you because now... Maybe you are missing colors in your color palette and you find your product needs something and things start to splinter really quickly. So that's where we talk about really needing a holistic approach, a whole brand system. And those things will help you raise money, convert customers, get recruits. Often we're creating brands for startups as well that their whole goal isn't to raise money. They have the money. They need to recruit really great engineers and people from places like Uber and Google. If their brand feels like it falls flat or they don't know who they are or they're not clear, it's not very enticing. You know, So really thinking about that end user and that customer and what matters to them and then and creating something that connects with those people. And so a brand is more than the words in a logo. It's really all of the ways it shows up for that 
customer. So I have the goals of raising money, driving demand, recruitment, partnership. I think, okay, a brand is a fundamental part of bringing that to life. Where do I start? How do I go about creating a brand? Like, What's the process? So we start with talking to leadership, right? And talking to the people who started the company. Why does this exist in the world? And what are you disrupting? What are you, what do you want people to say about you? And really it's that rigor in the beginning of the process through this brand blueprint where we use that document as a North Star. You know, also what would make this a successful initiative at the end for you? Often sort of the mindset is what do I want to say about my company to the world? But we try and flip that to what does the customer need to make the decision? And the customer could be the investors. The customer could be it's whoever you're trying to capture with your messaging. So it really starts with understanding what problems they face, what they need to feel that has utility in their lives. And then Once we sort of understand those mindsets from the brand blueprint, and then also, you know, what makes the company different, what they're doing better than anyone else, sort of also flexing, where do they want to be in five or 10 years? All of a sudden, they're like, well, we're also going to launch clothing, you know, (laughs) and you're like, oh, okay, (laughs) Okay. we need a brand that really (laughs) flexes, you know, can, can be really, really flexible and doesn't just have this one thing. For example... It was really smart of Uber to not have their initial brand with just a car. And I wonder with when we're talking about AI, if Uber had fed to the prompts what they do, if all of those logos would have been a car. You know, not seeing the flexibility needed for a brand to expand into unknown areas so that it could be a little more flexible in in representing all the products under the umbrella. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. So Who should be in the room for these conversations? You know, obviously, this is the founder's baby, especially when they're just starting out. But who else needs to be in there? And more importantly, is there a limit? Can you have too many cooks in this kitchen all throwing a ton of ideas that that maybe don't make a bunch of sense and just make the process harder? I mean, absolutely. I'm sure it's the same uh, with you guys. It's really about buy-in. Anyone that's going to be making a decision we want in the room versus just having a few people in the room, but actually they're going to send it out. It makes the process a little more choppy. So really, it's important to have not just marketing in the room, but the leadership that's going to be commenting on this. Um, Because then they're there to hear sort of the strategy behind each of these brand worlds that we're presenting and understand the potential of each, you know, and and what brand tenants we're really trying to dial into or dial up or down with each concept. So I think having leadership in the room and then because ultimately too, they're going to be the ones to their respective teams, ensuring that everyone's following this so that it maximizes the utility of the exercise and it maximizes the investment they made. You know, they're investing in, in a brand identity You want everyone to sort of be an ambassador for that moving forward. You use the expression there, brand worlds. And so these are really sort of alternate futures for this company. Like in this world, you could go in this direction and here. And you have to choose your adventure there, right? So is this something that a startup can do themselves? Can you create your brand internally? Or do you really need that sort of third party lens without all the preconceptions that you have just growing up in a company? Do you really need a partner? Or can companies actually just do this themselves because, you know, resources are finite? The resources question is the interesting part of this. So it's all about ROI and utility here and making this come to life for your customer. So While some founders are absolutely brilliant at, you know, hey, I was thinking of this analogy and I'd really like this to show up and I drew this. That's really interesting to be able to get inside their heads. However, they can't often then articulate that in a partnership deck or a sales deck or an investor deck and then in a campaign and in social. And how does this all connect and come to life in a really cohesive way? And that's where the design studio comes in. So it's not that they can't create a logo. It's that How does that inform all of the rest of the touch points in a way that connects with the customer 
And what's the strategy behind that to really ensure that we are ownable and not looking like anyone else, you know, in the space. It's ownable, memorable. And and I think a design studio really comes in there in not only identifying the strategic opportunity, but then how to flex that brand across all of these spaces that are required today from digital to events or offline to even in a store or in the office, you know, bringing that to life for different users in different ways, but in a way that feels that it's cohesive and always connected. I love that. You know, startups aren't always competing against other startups. Sometimes they're competing against the big guys. So how can a good brand help a startup kind of start to compete with the big guys? What can it do for them? When you look at the big brands, there's a couple of opportunities here. One, I think when a startup has a really defined brand strategy and brand visual language, it makes them look much bigger than they are because it makes them look established, trustworthy, and often especially in B2B, one of the barriers to adopting new tech from a startup is the feeling that they might not be around in a year or two, or the product is going to change so much that it's going to leave this, this customer high and dry um, and make them you know, not look very good to their, their business. So the brand really helps kind of lay that foundation and feel like they are a very established company and helps them compete with the big guys in that way because it kind of pulls on those tenets of longevity. But with the big guys, there's also this opportunity that a lot of times the big guys sort of, there's a lot of dilution in their brand over time where it just feels really boring. And so there's this opportunity to create a little energy and a little sizzle in these startup brands that feel exciting and that people want to pay attention to. And they're, they're doing something exciting and new that you can adopt. When I've been involved in branding processes, and you have a range of these different sort of worlds, it's hard to decide which one to choose. Like, okay, some of them, I might have a personal preference, but it might not be the best for the business. So how do I know it's the one? Like, how, what, what makes a good brand? And how do I know it when I see it? <laughs> right. You know, with these different brand systems that we show our worlds, They each kind of pull on different strings. Maybe one is more trustworthy, one is more disruptive, but they all are authentically connected to the business itself. We're never showing something and you shouldn't be seeing something that doesn't authentically connect to what you're doing out in the world. But also, if we were to put that logo in consideration, let's say the the logo is on a website, which is one of the ways that we show it. You know, what else is in your customer's consideration set? So If they close out of your window and they pop over to three of your competitors, what else are they seeing? Um, And what's really going to stand out in the space and is making an impact? You know, what we say in our, in, after we present round one of the brand identity is put it away at 8 PM. And when you wake up because you have fresh eyes right now, you know, you are replicating your customer in this moment. So when you go to bed having not looked at it, and then you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing you remember? So, you know, that memorability is really, really important to ensuring that that it stands out, you know, and that people will remember it. I think it's really fascinating that you bring the brand up kind of in every stage of the buyer journey, because I think most people don't think of it that way. You know, you it's more of like an awareness play, a very top of funnel thing, but you're right. It plays such a role throughout, you know, from all the way from awareness to consideration to close, all of that. So we know what a good brand looks like. What are some of the mistakes that companies make when they try to create a brand? I think either they follow trends. You know, one of those things with trends is, yes, it feels comfortable. You know, oh, this is a cool font I saw. And so we're going to use this, but it doesn't connect with the customer in any way because it doesn't mean anything. You know, some of those great moments are when the brand has these sort of surprises or aha moments, like the hidden arrow in the negative space of the FedEx logo. Once you see it, you're like, oh, that's cool. You know, what are these little aha moments you can include that really conceptually connect with the business? So I think following trends is one of them. Not thinking through 
how tedious it's going to be if you don't have a full system for the rest of your employees to try to stick to that brand. I think a lot of times our clients are met, you know, when they first come to us, they've been met with this blank white page problem where everyone, yeah, yeah, they have a logo, they have a color palette and they have a font, but then they have to create this presentation and they have nothing to reference. So they're sort of forced to be these art directors. It's just a huge waste of time and the messaging gets splintered. So I think if they can have a more fully baked system from the get-go, it saves a lot of headache and also just keeps everything much tighter. I have my logo, my new brand. I have my style guide. I have my visual identity, the brand book, all the fonts. It looks great. We're all agreed we like this. This is <laughs> where we're going. We're ready to go. What happens? The process typically isn't just something where we need a brand. We want to know why. Why is this now coming up for you? Because there's often a pain point for the, the company. They're not getting customers or their website isn't great or they need investment. There's always a reason. So why do they need this at this point? And so then we really tackle that from a utility standpoint. So, you know, the project should include some outputs that have utility for the business. So you obviously have all the the toolkit that you're talking about, but then likely it will be accompanied by a new website that showcases the new brand hopefully a PR push that amplifies that new brand and that story. And then a few other things. And we typically recommend to how are you immediately and in the next year going to be utilizing this brand to push it out. And then we want to design those areas so that the team has templates that they can reference moving forward and that they can really take this and move forward without being handcuffed to us. So they feel empowered to utilize this whole system that they have and put it together in really creative ways, but it won't break because it's so robust that they've just got a lot to pull from. Is part of your process kind of reinforcing at the end, okay, here's what we've we've all agreed on. We love it. It looks great. Here's the templates. Here's where we're going to use it. All of these things. But then inevitably somebody is going to come along and they're going to fiddle with a deck and they're going to mess with a template and they're going to move stuff around. So do you encourage an organization to have almost like the brand police or like, should there be a brand police other than, you know, maybe a creative director, which most startups aren't going to have, but how do you advise them on really keeping this consistent, this beautiful thing that you've put together? That does inevitably happen if there's not buy-in from the leadership to sort of be the ambassadors for the brand. So it really comes from the, the business itself it's hard for people to not put their own stamp on things, right? To not say, oh, okay, well, I found this really cool font or I love this color yellow. And so I'm going to use it because now this makes it like my personal stamp on this brand. That's something that hopefully, you know, someone says that looks great, but you know, that's not part of our brand system because inevitably when more and more people do that, it really does fall apart and it takes the impact away from the exercise And so I think, you know, having leadership say when someone onboards, here's our style guide, but not only our style guide, it's our brand guide. So again, it's not just the look and feel, but how this comes to life in billboards, in social, in digital ads, what our insights are about our customers are, what does our company stand for? Why do we exist? You know, sort of a holistic messaging on the brand so that someone really sort of adopts that quickly when they come in the door and feels bought into that. Sometimes we'll see with our clients, this is where the relationship comes in with the design studio as well. We'll say, oh, hey, we were on your site the other day. This happened last week. You know, it was a client we worked on three years ago and and there's this random color and font happening right now, but only in certain places. And so, you know, we just reached out and said, is the system falling down somewhere that that you guys need a little help? Because we're happy to resolve that for you. And obviously we just do that. But brands, when they come into the world, not everything is going to be resolved. So it is this a little bit of an iterative process of learning. And so that's where, you know, seeing where things are holding up and where maybe we do need an extra palette color because the product shifted in a way that was unanticipated or we're highlighting something else. So it is iterative in a nice way, but it's nice to sort of include the studio I think for the company 
because it just ensures that everything was tight together. This is an investment, clearly, in coming up with the brand system and making that front and center for people as you onboard them. Because a lot of companies are growing very quickly and bringing in lots of people, so it's easy for it to get diluted. But you've made the investment, reinforce it in that onboarding process. And if the system is properly designed, it will have a bit of flex in it. And you've already thought about all the different use cases, so you're going to get much more adherence to it. So I do like that, that framing. I love that too, because I think when new employees come on board, it makes them feel like they're a part of something. I think it's really fun to, you know, if someone onboards, give them a shirt with the logo on it, give them a, a little swag, and then give them the brand style guide. And they feel so included in the ethos of the company and so bought into it. And it's just, it's great for morale. A rebrand is not only great for PR and connecting with your customers, but it's great for recruiting and it's great for employee morale. They just feel like you care about where they work. So one thing, you know, you talk about new employees coming in, one thing, especially in the startup world where maybe the marketing department didn't necessarily exist when you guys came in, or maybe there's now room in the budget for a CMO. A lot of CMOs come in and they want to do a brand refresh. When do you know you're ready for a brand refresh? Is it a good idea for a startup to do a brand refresh? Like what are some of the signs that it's, that it's even needed? Well, one, I think that's a great point about startups not having a budget for a marketing team. And that's where, you know, choosing the right partner is so important and, and someone that's nimble and can sort of plug in like a, like we often plug in with our clients as their design arm, as their marketing arm, so that they don't have to have that expenditure up front, you know, which can be a difference between making it and not. And then they inevitably grow, which is fantastic. And they get a CMO. And again, that CMO, it kind of all flows again back to the customer. When that CMO comes in the door or that marketing, new marketing person comes in the door, why are they feeling it's needed? You know, sometimes we'll say, well, you've built all this brand equity in this brand that, you know, we didn't design or did design what's the need for it now? And and are your customers, is it falling down for your customers? Is it blending in too much? It's really coming back to the customer angle. And if the brand itself is working and they've built all this brand equity around it, but it's not hitting these other certain goals, or, or sometimes it's also, it's not they need a rebrand, they just need an extension. You know, the CMO is like, I want to do all these things, but we don't have them. So we need a rebrand. It's actually, no, you just need a brand an evolution, not a revolution. Adding in new things to flex the brand and make it make it better for all these touch points. So it's really just, again, coming to the customer on, is it working for them? And if not, then how far do we push it? So one of the decisions you have to make early on, I think, is uh, when it comes to branding, are we going to be uh, like a, a house of brands where we have a main brand, but each of our different products, if you like, has a different brand. And I, you know, I think of Meta or with Facebook and Instagram and threads, et cetera. Or are we going to be like a branded house, like a Google with Google Workspace and Google One and all, all their things are called Google something. Mm-hmm. I know that the parent company is called Alphabet. But how do you think about that sort of dynamic between those two, those two choices? Those are really interesting choices specifically and strategically. So Meta is really, those customers are different customers across those platforms or or products that they have. And they're also social channels. So because social channels need this like very deep level of authenticity to feel that they're connecting authentically with their user, they sort of need to have their own brand identities aligned with them and they can live in their own sort of siloed worlds under underneath meta because an instagram user doesn't care that they're using meta an oculus user doesn't care that they're using meta with google that's the same customer across all of those products so they want that consistency and if they want that consistency in product and to understand okay i've I've learned these tools I've, i've adopted these things then it's important that the brand sort of plays off of that and says, visually, this is part of the same umbrella of products or suite of products. So you won't have to have this threshold to learning this new thing. 
in Google's case, what they've done is really smart because it, it keeps that common thread through line that helps people understand that it's all one big product. And in Meta's case, those customers don't care. And so again, it really comes down to the customer and their mindset. Great. Any other advice that you might have as startups are thinking about brand and their brand identity? Yeah. I mean, I would think about when they talk about their company to customers or investors, what are the moments when those people light up? And those messages are really resonating with people. And what are what are those hair on fire moments where people are, are are like, oh my god, I need that. You know, I think that's that's real research that that they should take note of. And then, what are the most common questions that they're getting from these different customers or investors or users? Um, and really pay attention to those because I think when you have those common questions, you need to sort of answer those in the storytelling of the brand, you know, and the messaging. And really lean into those hair on fire moments too. Great. Look for hair on fire moments. Got it. (laughs) So I want to go on to our next section, which is called Smart People, Dumb Questions. And I literally have a bag of dumb questions uh, here. And I'm going to pull a few of them out. And these are all uh, personal questions. So the first one here, what is it? Oh, here. What's the first concert that you ever went to? Aerosmith. (laughs) Wow. Where, Where was that? Well, I grew up in California, so it was somewhere in the Bay Area, and uh, I was 13, and Aerosmith was much, much older. It was like a throwback thing, but I think uh-huh. it was, was like very cool at the time. So yeah, so I went with my friend, and for some reason, my parents let us go in the mosh pit as 13-year-olds, so that was, <laughs> that was wild. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. I love that. What's the most dangerous thing you've ever done? And it can't be being in the mosh pit at uh, Aerosmith. <laughs> uh, I went to Greece with a friend and uh, we rode one of those little ATVs from Fira to Ia in Santorini, which is just two opposite mm-hmm. ends of the island, because we wanted to see the sunset and the pretty part. And we were staying in the not pretty part because we couldn't afford it at the time. And we didn't think about after the sun sets that there, it's going to be dark and the ATV didn't have headlights. So we had to drive it all the way back in the dark on a really busy road. And my friend and I were just shaking, you know, but giggling at the same time, like big idiots. But it was, we made it and we saw the sunset. The white knuckle ride on an ATV right. in the dark. Yeah. Sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Doing all the tourists a good name. Um, what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? I ate, oh, alligator. Is that strange? Yes. That's <laughs> strange, Crocodile, yeah. Crocodile, alligator. Yeah. I also, you know, in Australia, they serve a uh, kangaroo. Yeah. So you know, I had that. I mean, no, I'm not a super adventurous eater, but when I'm at a place, I'll, I'll try some stuff. Just for, really for the street cred. Right. Go to Australia, you're going to eat some strange things. I think I had both of those things on a pizza. They had some strange things over there. <laughs> What book are you currently reading? I like to intermix fluffy books with sort of philosophical books. So I'm reading The Myth of Sisyphus. Oh. It's uh, this interesting sort of philosophical look. And a lot of this influences sort of the psychology of branding too. But the interesting point is what if we looked at arguments between people as not winning and losing, but more as a dance, you know? And so if you change your mindset about certain things that we expect in our culture, but you sort of change the way that you're approaching them, how does that shift how we behave? Which is is, uh, is really interesting to me that if you don't think of certain things in a black and white way, how that changes um, our perspectives on how, how to act in our culture. That's a much smarter answer than I was thinking, because I was thinking it's a lot like pushing a rock up, up a hill <laughs> and it rolling back down. <laughs> Over you yeah. over and over again. And that's what designing brands can sometimes <laughs> feel like. Totally, totally. But I do, I like this idea of how people behave in the world and how can we approach expected and anticipated behaviors, but then also how can we move things forward in a culture and build on, on where we're coming from. Our next section is called Fired Up Five. So Nicole. I do not have a bag of questions, but I've got five of them. 
first things first, what would you be doing if you were not in design? I originally went to school for fine art installation. And so, I mean, I guess it's, it's a cheating answer. It's like an adjacent field. It's uh, So I would do installation art where, you know, more like fine art bent to it. I thought she was going to say like ATV tour guide in Greece, (laughs) but no, I was wrong. (laughs) Here's a little bit deeper one. What is the best career advice you've ever been given? You know, it's really simple. Someone told me, and I'm sure every, everyone basically has served this advice when they're born. If you love what you do, you will be successful at it. You know, you can be the best in your field if you love what you do. I had sort of a roundabout way of getting to what I'm doing because I kept being, again, sort of adjacent to it and then finally made the jump over to design. But I think finding what you love about what you're doing, and it's it's a process. You know, I don't think anyone comes out at 18 going, I'm going to be this exact thing. And then they end up in that exact spot when they're 50. I think, you know, those if they do, that's really fortunate. But I do think there's a bit of trial and error to that. Yeah, absolutely. So what is the tool that you cannot do your job without? I really need inspiration for my job in order to create. And so the things I find most inspiring are getting outside and, you know, walking through a city, walking through a museum, going into bookstores. I think that sort of environmental inspiration that's out and about and seeing, you know, the world around you is really informative on on what the opportunities are where you can be inspired and excited and energized about the design. So what's one thing that you have learned in the last year, especially as as 2023 gets closer and closer to being over? What's the biggest thing you've learned? Good question. You know, as we talked about AI, I think adopting it into our workflow has been really interesting just to expand and you're probably asking a much deeper question and I'm giving you like, like a really a functional <laughs> quite answer to this question. But I think just being open to these newer programs and adopting them into a workflow, leaning into those those moments of unexpectedness in, in our business too, you know, and seeing where, as we talk about, you know, hair on fire moments for our clients, it's, it's the same for us, you know, where are we finding traction um, and what are our customers need from us? Absolutely. So last question, it kind of comes full circle to the beginning of the conversation. So AI, overhyped or underused? I would say both. Can we say both? (laughs) You can say both. Absolutely. (laughs) It is both overhyped because I think it's just such a hot story that everyone wants to talk about it. And it's also underused just because I think there's a barrier to learning it right now that will go away it's a race right now and no one's a clear winner. And there's so many different platforms out there that I think, you know, you learn one and then that's not the winner anymore. It's this other one the next week. So I I think it'll slowly start to become more clear who the winners are, but it's underused because right now I think it's, it doesn't have as much utility as it could. And, and eventually it'll get there. But as we said, you know, when you use it just to generate ideas, that's great. When you use it to write headlines, it's terrible. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Kate Harris, co-founder and creative director of Siren. Thanks for being on Fired Up. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yes, please get in touch with us. Uh, We would love to hear from you. Our website is sirensf.com. And there's a contact there, or you can just email me directly, kate at sirensf.com. And I would be happy to chat about your brand project. Wonderful. Thanks so much for your time today, Kate. We look forward to talking to you again soon. All right. Thanks, guys.